So in this video, we're going to discuss the MOSFET threshold voltage. Uh, and this is typically written as VT. Um, and so now you know why I've been using phi T for the thermal voltage this whole time, because we've got a threshold voltage that's almost universally written as VT. So, okay, uh, what is the MOSFET threshold voltage? Well, it's the voltage at the gate uh, required to fully invert our semiconductor. In other words, if we've got a, let's say we've got a p-type semiconductor, because that's what we've been dealing with in these last few videos, and we've got our MOS sandwich structure with the metal oxide and semiconductor. And we initially had the semiconductor was p-type. So the semiconductor was p-type. And we had a bunch of holes floating around in the semiconductor. And then we applied a gate voltage VG, a voltage relative to this semiconductor, which we assume is grounded. And as the voltage got more and more positive, uh, we started first forming a depletion region, and that depletion region may have been present just at equilibrium uh, if phi ms was fairly large. Uh, so depending on phi ms, there may or may not have already been a depletion region there. But we start to form one regardless uh, as we apply a larger and larger VG. And eventually, this depletion region gets so large or VG starts getting uh, so big that we've got electrons that migrate from the semiconductor, free electrons that migrate from the semiconductor to coexist in here with these negative charges of the depletion region. And so this is what we refer to as inversion because we've now got mobile electrons, we've got mobile electrons near the gate or underneath the gate, if you will. And so the threshold voltage is the voltage that we need in order to get this. Well, from the last video, uh, remember that the central quantity that determines well, whether or not we have inversion, if we just take a look at the, the semiconductor's band diagram, the central quantity that determines whether or not we have inversion was this surface potential, phi s. Or if we want to be pre precise, it's q phi s, because phi s is a voltage, q phi s is an energy. And we said that when we get, so when this band diagram bends enough such that this distance uh, is equal to phi fp, in other words, oops, sorry, my, uh, my palm rejection appears to be off. In other words, if this initial doping is equal to the effective doping of the electron, so if this were an n-type material, it would have a certain Fermi potential. So in other words, the Fermi energy, which we know is gonna be up here above the intrinsic Fermi energy, this is gonna be a certain distance away from the intrinsic Fermi energy. And we call this quantity phi Fn or phi is not, not phi of p, phi fn, if it's an n-type semiconductor. And if it's a p-type semiconductor, then we call it phi fp. And so when the surface potential, or when the band diagram at the very edge starts to look as n-type as it initially was p-type, in other words, this distance at the edge is equal to this distance at this edge, or phi s, which is just the sum of these two distances, uh, is 2 phi fp, then we say we have, we have inversion. And so how, do we, how, how does this dovetail with what we did previously? Well, remember, we said that the total amount of band bending in the previous videos 
was just equal to uh, the voltage drop across the oxide, or yeah, sorry, it's just the voltage drop across the oxide, plus phi s. And we spent, uh, we spent a good portion of time trying to solve for phi s. So we tried to solve for this. And we showed that this can just be reduced to a quadratic equation if you want to know what it is. Uh, but we're saying that if we have inversion, we know what phi s is. So we can just rewrite this equation uh, plus vg. This is equal to v ox plus 2 phi f. Uh, phi fp for being being precise. And if you don't remember what phi fp or how to calculate it is, it's just the thermal voltage times the natural log of the doping divided by the intrinsic carrier doping. That's that's how you how you calculate it. And so remember, we also in the last video we said that v ox was a function of phi fp. So we could rewrite phi ox as the depletion region charge over the capacitance, uh, the area per unit area capacitance of the oxide. And we said this was equal to 2 times epsilon silicon times QNA times phi s. But in this case, this phi s we know to be 2 phi fp. So we, we didn't have to do any work at all. We didn't have to solve any quadratic equation. Um, and if, since we want this equation in terms of VG, because we want to know the gate voltage applied, uh, if we rewrite this whole equation, VG is going to be 2 phi FP plus the square root 2 epsilon silicon QNA times 2 phi FP. Uh, minus the magnitude of phi ms. And we're done. This is the threshold voltage, Vt. This is how you calculate it. Uh, these are all just numbers in here. Epsilon, silicon, Q, our doping, the Fermi, uh, intrinsic Fermi potential, or phi fp. I don't really know if it has a name. Um, and phi ms. So the only trick here is figuring out um, what what these quantities are. Now there are a couple subtleties that I want to go over real quick. And the first, uh, so subtlety one, is that phi ms, so we always assumed that this metal work function, uh, so if this is the Fermi function of our metal, this is the vacuum level before we put everything together, and this is the Fermi level of our silicon. We assumed that this Fermi level was beneath this Fermi level. And it's possible that it's not. So it's possible that the Fermi level of silicon uh, relative to the metal is actually up here, or rather that the silicon was much lower. And in that case, we need to flip the sign of this phi ms term here. So we need to make this a positive term. And that's just because the band bending is going in the other direction. So band bending is going in the other direction. Uh, so if you understand things in terms of band bending, then you'll be just fine. Uh, and the second subtlety is that sometimes within this oxide region, so within this oxide region, there are some bound positive charges. So there are some positive charges that don't move around. Typically, uh, we think that they're sodium ions. Uh, so typically, these are like Na plus ions just sitting in there. And if, we've, if you've got oxide, if you've got charges within the oxide, then you need to replace the, um, this V ox term uh, with V ox minus the charge that's bound the positive charge that's balanced divided by the capacitance of the oxide. And that's just because uh, we said that there were going to be some positive charges here on the metal. Well, we need to add the positive charges on the, on the oxide. In other words, um, the, the oxide voltage drop we will get is reduced by the amount of positive charge that's already there. Um, and so these are these are the two additional subtleties that typically textbooks go over in the first pass treatment, but I thought made it just 
incoherently difficult to, to understand at first. So in the next video, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the MOS full three terminal or four terminal structure. And this is going to lead into understanding the body effect. The body effect. And that will pretty much complete the treatment of MOS device physics. After that, um, it's all it's all essentially uh, circuit analysis. So uh, congratulations, you've you've almost made it to the very end of understanding uh, MOSFET device physics. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please uh, like and comment, subscribe, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks.